The Audio Train programme is supported by the following businesses. Tizers, a leading media insurance company. Garment Printing, supplier of printed clothing and branded merchandise. Prager Metis, an international advisory and accounting firm. AV Resilience, a supplier of technical consultancy and broadcast equipment. Mint & Co, a dynamic legal and business affairs company. And Note Tracks, a platform for audio producers, engineers and collaborators to take notes, get feedback and share projects. Audio Train is part of Audio UK, the trade association for professional audio production companies. Welcome to this evening's Audio Train Skills Sharing webinar. Uh, we're talking about working with actors today. Of course, this doesn't just apply if you're a drama producer and you're working on a play, but when creating your productions, it's often too good to have the actors voicing parts, whether it's just a straight voiceover or reading an audio book or recreating a scene, you'll always want to get the best from everyone. So I'm delighted that today Mel Harris, the Managing Director of Spark Lab, who's an extremely experienced producer of dramas, factual programmes, podcasts and audiobooks, is going to work with actor Eve Shotton. Eve has worked quite a bit with Mel in audio, but is also established in theatre, TV, film and voiceover work. So thank you for both of you to joining us. Hello, Mel and Eve. Um, perhaps just start, Mel, Hi. with telling me uh, what your current production is that you're working on. Um, yes, well, current production is a huge 10-part um, drama for Radio 4, afternoon drama slot um, called Our Friends in the North by Peter Flannery. Some of you may remember the landmark TV series that, that it was um, in 1995. and. Uh, what's different about our offering. He has rewritten it for radio and um, we're also commissioning a new 10th episode to bring it more up to date. So really that's all I do now because it's so huge. Um, yeah, yeah I can me. understand that, um, definitely. I remember mm. it first time round, I absolutely loved it, absolutely loved it. Mm. And, and Eve, are you working on this production as well? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, so I was very lucky, lucky enough to uh, be down in London with Mel recently. Um, we were, at, well, I was recording for about six days, which was great. And I got to play a real range of characters. Um, so it was a really nice opportunity to flex those voice skills. Now, Mel, I think you're going to take us through some, just some live directing to kick off this session. Okay. Um... Well, I thought we'd just jump, jump straight into a scene um, from our friends in the north that we recorded a few weeks ago. Um, and I asked, um, because it, the cast is enormous and my budget was not really enough, so I asked most of the actors to do far too many parts um, and I cast them because I knew that most of them could do that. Um, and Eve, certainly. So the main role that I wanted Eve for was to play Elaine, who becomes Tosca's second wife, if anybody remembers the story. And this is the first time they meet. Now, forgive me because I haven't got the actors playing Tosca and Geordie in here, so I will just read those lines in. But we did a lot of that in the recording because I never had everybody I needed ever in one day. Um, and uh, so we're in a disco um, and Tosca has really gone out to just have a nice time and pick somebody up, really. Uh, okay, so I'll do Tosca. Elaine? What? You're the most amazing person I've ever met, and I don't normally feel this way about... Bet you say that to all the girls. Is it the same for you? Oh, here's your mate coming in. Hey, you need your bloody head examined, you. You know the cops bust your door in. They arrested Anthony. His mother's going mad. Yeah, I've been home, I saw. Sorry. Can I stay with you tonight? Stay with me. Oh, yeah, you can keep with Anthony. Show him how to use a Johnny. Sorry. Sorry about Anthony. Who's this? This is Elaine, if you must know. Geordie. Geordie. 
Shall I get what all a drink, Tosca? Okay, so my only note to Eve, I'm not going to push this, but would be to say um, that Elaine is the sweetest person ever. It, she's the sweetest person mm -hmm. in the whole series, and we really need to get that. We need to get that straight away. So mm -hmm. in real life, when we did this, we worked on that um, quite a bit and uh, um, so that you could find that um that you could you could you could you could find her really and continue mm. that in all the other scenes that followed um the first time i worked with you was on an audio book um do you remember yes yeah how could we forget it was called beast and it was <laughs> aptly named in terms of recording so should we just have a quick switch to that um it was our yeah. first audio book we made for audible and it's not what an audio book should be at all because there were loads of characters in it it was multi-voice they call it um and um, so Eve certainly had to play, well, you played two characters in this. You played a lot more in Our Friends in the North. Um, so shall we just um, just do a tiny extract from, um, from Beast? And this is, I think, the second time that we meet you. Um, mm -hmm. And you've, you've set out an internet challenge, haven't you? You've, you've got all these hundreds of thousands of followers. Um, so why don't you just pick it up and I'll, I'll stop you if I feel we're not quite hitting it, okay? Am um, I going from the... Um the kind of in five days bit or from the yeah hey guys yeah in five days okay yeah why not in five days i'm gonna meet a vampire that vampire is going to kill me i'll be dead in five days hey guys lizzie b here as you can see i'm still here so far anyway this is of course day two of the dead in six days challenge Guys, I've been sent my first challenge from a vampire called Vladlina, and I smashed okay, I'm it. Just gonna, of... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you when I just interrupt you a second um, before we go any further. I think that she's really, really young. I, I mean, younger than I hear you doing her at the moment. I think she's, I mean, I think in reality, in terms of the text, she may be slightly older, but she's playing like a teen and she's appealing to teenagers and those are her followers so i think you need to brighten her up sharpen her up and make her sound kind of breathless excited and um younger than she does at the moment have another go hey guys lizzie b here as you can see i'm still here so far anyway this is of course day two of the dead in six days challenge guys I've been sent my first challenge from a vampire called Vladlina and I smashed it, of course. If this is all a bit too spooky for you, please head on over. If this is all a bit too spooky for you, please head on over to have a look in my shopping haul videos, which are all available down there in Linkland. Yeah, I think that's much better, but I think that we're not going to do it again, but my next note for you before we start recording probably would be... Um, I think you can just bump up the energy as well. I mean, I, I think Lizzie in this in this story um, rehearses and rehearses and rehearses, and then she just she gets it in one take. That's how I imagine it. And she is just just so excited and really really needs to get everybody's um, appetite going for what on earth could happen next. I also need you in this story, Gemma, much later on, um, the girl who's not from the northeast. Um, again, she's a teen. She's a bit sadder, isn't she? um mm. doesn't have a very nice time uh so do you want to just um why don't we pick it up yeah. from uh on that script let's pick that from i still don't know who my real father is i still don't know who my real father is my real daddy i might try and find out ask my mum for my birth certificate but i don't imagine she'll but i don't imagine she'll know where it is it'll have been sold for crack is a birth certificate worth anything? Who knows? Who cares? Because he'll just be a name, won't he? What closure will it give me to see his name? I might look him up. I might look him up on Facebook. See if he's posting Brexity shit on Twitter. Or I could just okay, leave it alone. Stop there. I think that again. I think she's younger. I know she's sadder, and she's had a she had a terrible life. Um, but um, I don't want to bring the energy down too much and make her too draggy. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's, I think she's a bit more cocky maybe. I mean, 
Okay, let's 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 pretend we're not directing anymore. Let's just be if, if we were doing this for real, um, you can see that he's working off an iPad for a start. I'm working off script, um, but I would work on, off an iPad for um, Audible. If you can get your actors on iPads, hooray. It's just transformed recording um, audio for us. Lots of still don't want to use it, but um, use them. But if we can, we, we will. Um, and um, and I, and also we don't have a lot of time. You know, it's quick. Um, something I realize I haven't put in my notes, but I would say to any of you who are interested, um, I always try and decide there and then which take I'm going to use when I've recorded. I don't go back and re-listen unless I absolutely have to, because that saves time. And also I know, I know when I've heard it and I can just say, you know, take three with a pickup um, and that'll be marked in the script by my production coordinator and on we go. Um, Eve, can I just ask you, um, mm -hmm. do you... Do you feel that um, you must have you've worked with a range of directors? Is it do you get better the more takes you're asked to do in audio, or do you not? You know, what, what's your view on doing loads and loads of takes and fewer takes? Um, I suppose it's it's dependent on what exactly it is. Like, the I don't necessarily think. Um, I get better every time unless there's a specific thing. So things like the notes that you give me are usually um, character notes and things like with this. Um, so with the audio books, um, I found that uh, once we'd found the character, so with Lizzie B, maybe more, there were, there were kind of shorter extracts and um, sometimes I needed to be nudged in the direction of brightness. And so that really kind of helped and doing it maybe two times, the second time sort of getting it. But with Gemma, um, I remember once we had the character, it was really a case of just getting through it and we split it into sections and it was what was really nice about that with that character and because it's an audio book was once I'd found it, um, you didn't interrupt the kind of flow if it was working. And then it was only kind of specific things that then um, we paused and kind of talked through if there were any other sort of challenging bits or any changes in direction in terms of her feelings. We, we'll come back and I'll ask you some more questions later. I just want to move on um, with the, just the, the stuff that, we've, that we, we want to try and get through this afternoon or this evening. But thank you very much. Yeah, I think the right notes can help a writer, an actor find their way, obviously, and get moving, get motoring, which we need to do with audiobooks the most particularly. Um, I just wanted to say that um, Caroline's introduction really said what I need just what you need to know about me and Spark Lab that we do a range of stuff. But my specialism really is working in drama, working with actors and writers. So I feel very, very lucky. I mean, I moan all the time, like we all do, about how much work there is and never enough money and blah, 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 or how little work there is. But actually, it's an enormous privilege to spend so much time with writers and actors and musicians, with with artists really. That's that's who I hang out with for my as part as my profession, which is um, fantastic. And especially actors, because they're so um, willing and playful, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, okay, first slide. This is just a beginning, really. That's all it is. My favorite slide, probably. Um, and it's just to try and get us um, all thinking, whoever I'm talking to, about what are the materials, what are the tools we have with which to make a piece of audio, whether it's factual or um, or fiction. And um, and these, I think, are the essential ingredients, really, the essential blocks we have to build with. And uh, and today I'm focusing on, I suppose, um, story, and that's the text, whatever kind of uh, audio we're making, um, character, um, and most specifically voice, and I'll probably touch on the others as well. Uh, so the voice, I mean, that really is the medium we're working with, um, uh, the, the sound, the audio, uh, and a voice can pull you in. Um, and I think it's probably uh, just absolutely key. So my question is, what is a producer? Because in audio, um, we're, we're everything, aren't we, on the whole? I mean, we're working with low budgets, we're often working very quickly, whether we're an established company or just or somebody working completely solo, making their own podcast on audio. And, um, so um, a producer, someone once told me, I thought it was a great definition, is someone who brings the best people together to make something exceptional happen. That's really what we do.
we gather, we just gather all the talent we can in one space if we're recording all together and, um, and just hope that works. And someone else once a very experienced producer said, uh, well, yeah, maybe, but actually producer is just someone who fixes problems all the time, she said in a tired voice. And certainly it feels like that a lot too. There's always problems that come up and, um, and we do have to be the person that finds a solution for them. But in working with actors or working in fiction, um, however, however tiny and however large um, the piece is, uh, you're also going to be directing actors. So let's just have that. Um, so a definition of, of what a director is. I mean, I found millions of great quotes, and um, <clears throat> and I think it's. Um, I mean, this is one Kevin Bacon. There you go. There's an actor, um, and I think it is about that. It is about creating the right environment or the best environment, really, because by the time you get in with the actors. Um, whether they're recording remotely or in a studio or in a real location like this one that was Trinidad, by the way, a couple of summers ago. Um, the, um, you know, your work as producer is done, really. You, are, you just have to be in the moment with the actors and make sure that they are safe and you've created the right playground, really, for, for great things to happen. Um, and then, so what's, a, what's an actor? Let's have a look at... Um, Hayley Atwell playing twins in a drama we made some years ago, uh, playing her player, being a twin. Um, and Meryl Streep, I love this quote. She says, it's not about being someone different. Um, it's about finding the sim similarity in what is apparently different and then finding myself in there. So actors, you know, we all use words like truth and self and I don't know, all that kind of stuff. Um, what do you, Eve, over to you quickly. What do you think? How would you describe being an actor? What would you say? What is what's your um, thing? What do you do? Uh, well, <laughs> I think it's um, I suppose like I think play is really important, and um, and really it is just pretending, but uh, pretending in a way that is believable and truthful and convinces an audience. And so often in that pretending, you are finding um, the truth of what the character is going through in yourself. Um, and kind of bringing scripts and stories to life, I suppose. Um, I would say, and this is, this is a bit boring, really. I try not to be too boring, and I'll, and I'll rattle through to get to the bits that I think you're really most interested in about how do you actually talk to actors and get them to get them to be and do what you want them to be and do. Um, but my contention is actually um, the producer role is huge uh, when you're bringing people together to make things happen, and that most of the... Um, most of the work is before you begin. And for that, you need a plan, you need a really good plan. Audio is quite text-based, the kind of audio that I make. Um, you might need an actor for a voiceover, <clears throat> for archive, to read an extract, to read a poem or translation of something else, um, or a book, a whole audio book, or to dramatize an extract, we mentioned that. Or you might need a group of actors like I often do to make a full length drama. And whatever you need and whoever you need, you first need the plan. Um, and drama in the UK in particular is very text based. So we start with the story, the drama, the book, the poem, the extract, the text. We have a great tradition in this country, in the UK, of valuing um, and respecting writers, and particularly in audio, because without the script, we don't have anything really. We just don't. It's different in factual work. Um, the producer is the writer in a way. I mean, very much, I would say. Um, but really, our job as directors working with a fictional text is to realise the vision of the writer, the meaning of that text. And to do that, we have to understand the text. Um, we have to understand the vision of the writer. Um, and of course, we bring some of our own ideas and interpretation to it. But our primary responsibility um is to make what is written work for the audience uh, and um in europe it's different in film it's different a script is seen as a map for the director in the uk it begins with the writer and it ends with the writer and the writer is often there if it's a you know not a dead writer a live writer contemporary writer um, so um, so I have to make sure that the script is studio ready and that can take an enormous amount of time and a lot of drafts. So there's a huge amount of preparation just on the text alone. Um, I wish it was more um, 
um, I wish it was, you know, I wish it was quicker, more immediate, more um, spontaneous, but actually it isn't on the whole. Um, but you're in charge. I'm in charge. We're all of us in charge as producer directors, and we have to know what we're doing and understand the text so we can be clear about what we're asking actors to do. Um, unless you are recording a piece of improvisation, but even then you need to know more than anybody else, I would say. Um, and actors like to know what you're thinking. They like to know what the vision is. They like to be able to find their part in communicating that once it's clear. Um, so the questions you ask, I ask myself all the time about the story is what is it about, which is different from what happens in it. Um, how will I engage the audience? What do I want the audience to be left with? So I'm thinking about all the parts, not just um, what I'm doing in that moment. And then you have to bring your team together. Uh, this is a fraction of what's on my production checklist. As a company, we have a template, we have columns for initials, dates, by when, when it's been, when it's been done. But obviously, you've got contracts to make up. Um, <clears throat> you've got various situations of script, the final one. You've got to get that in PDF and onto people's, lap, uh, people's iPads. Um, you have to cast. Um, you have to make a list of everybody. All that stuff, obviously, risk assessments. Where are you recording? Um, how is everyone going to get there? Uh, you need your schedule, um, clearances, compliance, all that stuff. And that's just some of it. That is just some of it. Uh, but don't skimp on that, is what I would say, at your peril. Um, and um, interestingly, this is a complete aside, but people think that drama is hugely expensive. It is. Uh, it is much more expensive than making a straightforward factual program, I would suggest, usually. But... Um, of my budget, say for a Radio 4 hour of 22K, 50% of that goes straight out on the writer, the writing, uh, the writer and the actors. So then I'm left with, um, say, 20-25% 20, to spend on everybody else and on studio, um, and the rest on me, uh, overheads and production fee. So it's not really a money spinner. It's just a lot of work. But thank goodness it's fun a lot, a lot of the time. Not all the time, for sure. Um, so I would say, so then you've got your plan, um, your checklist, you know what your text is, um, and then you've got to find your actor or your actors. And I think it's a really big uh, question that, you know, how do you find who you want? You know who you want, you know what you want, um, and you don't have long in a recording session because that's expensive time. Well, all time is expensive. Um, in a, in a drama, I aim to record 30 minutes a day of finished audio. Um, it's much more than that with an audio book on the whole, I think. Maybe not much more, a bit more. Um, and I can't fix an actor who doesn't sound right for the part or who can't do it. I can't fix them when they're there in front of me. I have to know that I've got the right person long before I start. Um, casting is everything. Well. Script is everything, casting is everything, the checklist is a lot too. Uh, and, um, and in radio drama in particular, or any kind of audio, audiences make a decision very, very quickly about whether they'll stay with it. You know, they can stop, you can turn it off in an instant, they can move on to something else with a quick swipe of their phone. Um, so um, I need to, and particularly with drama, my God, I mean, I'm the, I'm the same as everybody else. If I, if I tune in, um, 10 minutes into a drama, I think, oh, what's the point of staying listening? I've missed the first bit. But sometimes something that will hook me, um, and it, well, not sometimes, yeah, sometimes it will always be the voice. It will always be the voice. And I'll just hear something in a voice, in a tone, in a manner, in a whisper or a shout, something. I'll think, oh, that's interesting. Perhaps I'll stay a little bit longer. So voice is really, really important. Um, and and can pull people in so that's where it begins really and ends and continues right the way through um where do we find actors uh, i mean we subscribe to spotlight which is a fantastic tool and um very powerful tool you can search on people that you don't know yet through spotlight you can search on accents regions locations ages all kinds of stuff um if you're a small per a small company or a single person making stuff, I'd say, you know, the indie sector is incredibly helpful. If you really feel you need access to shortlist, con uh, to spotlight, contact some um, companies like us 
who obviously do subscribe and we'll see if we can help you um you know occasionally we'd be very happy to do that um but you can you can google people you can watch actors on youtube you can go on to voiceover agencies and hear clips um all there's many, many different ways and i would just say start keeping a list if you know you're going to be looking for actors start keeping your own database of stuff actors you've watched actors you've heard of actors you admire um and then um i would say um uh, I would order. I would try and audition on the phone usually to save time. I wish. I wish we get everybody together and do proper read-throughs and rehearsals before I finally cast. But that's la la land on our budget, sadly. Um, voiceover actors are easier to find because voiceover agencies have really good websites, and you can click through and hear a range of accents and so on. For the, mostly for the kind of work I do, I I need trained actors, not voiceover artists. I find that. Although they can be fantastically versatile and really professional, um, they um, they're a bit more difficult to work with. Uh, they just they just do what they do and they do it really really well. Um, but I I think I, I on the whole I need actors and um, who've got fantastic voices and can do a whole range of things and are used to working with directors, uh, probably in theatre initially. Um, for audio, I want fluency and intelligence in my actors. I really need intellectual and emotional intelligence i need them i haven't got long i need them to get it um and get it fast and probably get it before they arrive to work with me um, and be prepared to keep uh, pushing and trying and experimenting um with the ensemble and with me uh, i used to teach quite a lot at the manchester theater school um just teach working in audio for young um actors training there and it's a bit like, you know, with the expression, the camera loves her or loves him. And it's the same with the microphone. There are some, um, microphone loves some voices and can't cope with others. I mean, I've auditioned young actors jumping in front of the microphone and their voice just hits me like a plank. I mean, it's just hits me over the head. It's too much. And even if I bring them down and bring them down and bring them down, it's not a, it's not a voice that the microphone loves. It's quite specific um, and very different. Uh, so you need to listen and listen and listen and audition on the phone, audition in person if you can, listen to clips and talk to other indies who work with actors too. You know, we can always recommend. I'm very dependent on colleagues, both in-house, outside, who work with actors um, to give me uh, some suggestions often. Um, you make your choices, you check availabilities, you drop your schedule, you book your actors. Uh, you've got contracts. I'm not going to go into all of that. You know, if you're working in the BBC, there are equity agreements um, with minimum rates and so on and so forth. Outside the BBC, you can negotiate. But think about, think about, some, you know, it's always difficult, isn't it, to gauge the value of someone um, and their skill. Um, but uh, you can negotiate. Um, and, um, and we're also trying to clear as much as we can of everything we make now. So we've got some chance of selling work on and that's another discussion, another another webinar really. I don't know how you will make your programs, but this isn't very clear and it's not meant to be. This is a snapshot of one of my 15 days. Um, and I literally account for every minute of the day, every day, uh, because that's the kind of time pressure I'm under. And I'll know exactly what scene I'm doing when. And we recorded everything out of sequence, which was horrible. Um, but sometimes you just have to do that. Um, and you have an actor in and you've just got to do everything they're in and record the other half of the scene another day when the other actor's in. Not ideal. Um, but possibly in the time of COVID, we worked in a COVID safe studio where everybody was in their own space, on their own mono mic, very close. And all the effect and the dynamism is put on in post-production. Uh, so that was a kind of, I hope we don't have to stay with that for too much longer. But when I'm fully cast, uh, I know everyone I've booked can do what I'll be asking them to do. I, that's, I'm cast on that basis. I won't, I shouldn't have any surprises. I shouldn't have anybody turn up who's not who I need them to be or imagine them to be. I think that's quite important. You know, the huge amounts of work is done before you are actually in a space with an actor, virtual or actual. Um, and I love working with actors who can bring something extra to the production. Uh, I mean, that really helps with any ensemble you bring together. So obviously perhaps more than one accent, um, a different voice, someone who can sing, um, someone who can play an instrument. I often have act, I often try and create music um, where we are, as well as all the effects of working on location. Um, someone who can cook well. We, go and, we make a two or three day drama in a house 
we have to have lunch and it's great if people want to bring flapjack and you know make stuff that's fantastic um people have a good idea for a good ear, um, ear and eye for continuity i've had actors help me so actually actually stop me and say mel if you if you change that scene now then what we recorded yesterday won't make sense hooray um i'll employ them again like a shot uh, so um where do you record? That's not a question um, to ask. Time of COVID, remotely, often. Eve's got her own setup, you can see, in her own house. Um, I'm trying to remember the software that we carried on using. Uh, I just got, um, hang on, let me just open my phone. Oh, it's called Riverside. Probably all got your favorite um, software to use for remote recording. But we, we, we settled on Riverside in the end after trying Zencaster and various other systems. Um, so, and I personally love to record in different places. And I think um, some of those slides um, I had quotes on or bits of wordage um, showed that, demonstrated that. I like to voice record if the scenes, if the drama set in a house, record in a house. I've recorded a submarine drama on a real submarine. I've recorded a drama about the protest camp at Manchester Airport before the second one was built there and then sliding around in the mud. Um, I've recorded in a farmhouse, a favourite farmhouse in Macclesfield Hills, wherever. Um, but think about then your your actors. Some, some actors don't like working that way. Some actors have complained bitterly to me when I've dragged them up a mountainside. Um, and um, you're in your studio, you're in location, you're wherever you're going to be recording your actors. Um, how do you begin? I always try and begin with a read through, quite a luxury. Couldn't do that for our friends in the north because we never ever had the whole cast in even for one episode in this on the same day but ideally um that's a great way to begin because then you can all hear one another and he and and see how it's coming together um and then you're on your schedule um and then i think the bit that i'm sure you've all been wanting to ask about or think about for me is um how do you talk to actors uh it took me a long time to learn that because i didn't come from a theater background which is where most people would begin, I think, as directors and most actors. Um, so I didn't really know. And um, and I would just say, after years of doing it, the way that you'd probably talk to anybody with respect, understanding, courtesy and kindness, um, always. You want them on side. I want them on my side, uh, on the side of the production, on the side of the writer, of the audience, of what we're trying to do together. Um, and I've worked with a lot of directors new to radio. I brought in about 12 directors new to radio on an afternoon drama batch bid some over a couple of years quite recently for Radio 4. I mean, actors experienced in theatre or um, film or TV, uh, documentaries. Um, and um, it was really interesting <laughs> what they knew and what they didn't know. One young documentary maker, I said to her, "You." You can't tell an actor directly what to do. So a kind of golden rule, golden no-no is never give a line reading. Um, oh, I try not to. A line reading is when you you actually say the line the way you would like the actor to say it. And that's just, you just want to jump in there quickly about line readings. They're not very helpful, are they? Yeah, no, I suppose they're not because that you're never going to be able to, as an actor, I'm never going to be able to do the voice that you completely imagine in your head and um i suppose sometimes as well it, as a director i've had directors do line readings for me and i can replicate it exactly the intonation that they've done it and it's still not right because actually they can't hear themselves saying it so a better yeah. um kind of way to do it is describe around what you want. Um, it, obviously it's fine to say if you want more emphasis on a word, but I suppose as an actor, it's like, it, I'm not acting if I'm just repeating, I suppose. Good point. Right, I'm gonna stop you there, good point. Um, and uh, so my question is what happens if they give you, if they don't give you what you want, you have to find another way of asking, as Eve said, I'm nearly at the end now. Um, and there are many ways of asking. Uh, the key is always, I think, in the text, probably, um, or it should be. So return to that. Um, who is who is this character you're asking the actor to be? Um, what do they want? What does that character want in this scene? What's going wrong for them? How emotional are they? Um, what's the point of the scene? Um, what And you might say, what if you try and bring it down a bit, if they're too big? Uh, 
or let's try that. Um, oh, let's try this. Or what if we try like this? Or, um, oh, almost there. I could use that. That's great. I could use that take, but I wonder if we just do one more, just try and get a bit more out of the scene. Um, there's a subtext running. These are just all phrases I might use. Um, she, you, your character knows more than he knows. Um, is there a way you can communicate that? Uh, can you pretend? This is a really important one. I have a lot of sympathy with a director like Mike Lee, who, you know, um, famously never lets the actors read the whole script before they start working. They just get a page, a page at a time, page at a day. Um, how do you, as an actor, how do you get your actors as a director to stay within the present tense of that scene? All scenes are in, a, in present tense. They're units of time that take place in the present and they play out, I suppose, and move the story on. So try, you want to get your actor to forget where they're going to end up so they can just be in that moment in that scene. Um, and all I would say by way of conclusion is, you know, actors bring so much to a recording, so don't waste them. Um, create the space, the conditions in which you and they can be surprised and moved and humbled and delighted. Uh, that happens to me all the time. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, in spite of all my preparation, I often don't really get a scene or a moment with an actor until I hear it which kind of makes sense because if you think of how long a writer has spent on creating the characters in the story, then, you know, it takes a lot of readings and listening and understanding and work to really get it to. Um, actors breathe life into text and, uh, you know, what a privilege it is to, to, to work with them. So have fun too. That's really important. Okay. I'm finished. <laughs> Mel, you're not finished yet, Mel. But thank you very much to both of you. Um, I've got a fair few questions come in, so I'm going to turn straight to the questions and um, both feel free to chip in. Um, so the first person wants to know, actually, we've talked quite a bit already about where you get your actors from, but they want to know, do you listen to any of the reels that folks actually send to you? Yeah, I mean, I do get emailed directly by a lot by actors and writers and sound engineers and musicians, everybody. I, listen, I always, always respond, even if it's just thank you so much for getting in touch. I'll keep your details to hand, something rather bland like that, because most people send stuff out and no one ever gets back to them. Um, do I listen to voice tapes? Not really. I mean, I might listen to a, like a little half a second, a minute or two. Um, if I'm looking for something and it just lands on my desk in that moment, then hooray, you know, it can be that serendipitous. Um, there are so many actors out there working, trying so hard to get work. It, you know, if I, I it could kind of make you cry thinking about it, really. They're so brave and bold. And But no, um, I, I, sometimes I do if, I, if it's a real imperative to do so. But often I'll just send a polite... Um, if I have a moment, I'll go onto their spotlight page or whatever, if I have a moment. But that doesn't really, it isn't really what cuts through to me. Um, no. Just going back to the pre-prep as well. Um, so when you, re you have um, commissions from Radio 4 and Audible, how much pre-prep do they allow you to have? So can you have table read reads or chats to the actors, I guess, over the phone? Or um, as you, do you have to do it as you go into the studio? Oh, they don't, nobody allows you to have anything. Development time is always on your own dollar. You just have to work your budget to try and allow for that as best you can. I mean, I think a big production with Audible, but I, I produced something very big for them recently, but I wasn't directing. I was just bringing everybody together and booking studio and kit and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that, I know that they had wonderful, they had several rehearsals to to build actor rapport, lovely idea. Um, I build actor rapport on the phone the week before the recording. Um, I always talk to my actors before we meet and make sure they, you know, they're happy and we've said hello and if I don't know them um, and they've got the script and they can ask me any questions at that point. And then I just say, we through. I mean, some, some, I just never quite had quite enough money to bring people together, especially in the time of COVID to do a rehearsal. Um, so, I just make sure that who I've got is really good and I'll audition them if I don't know them before I cast them, yeah. Are you back in the studio now or are you still doing everything remotely? Uh, in the summer, we were back in studio for this big Audible theatre, this American one, um, which was great, but the numbers were limited uh, in both in the cubicle and in the studio and they had good air con and, you know, we're all masked. 
Perhaps I could put the, the same question to Eve. Eve, are you back in studios or obviously you've got a home set up there. So are you doing it mostly from home? Um, it kind of depends on the job, really. So for the longer jobs, what Mel was saying then was that um, for our friends in the north, it was a um, safe, COVID safe studio. So we were all in a different studio within the main studio. And there was like a kind of uh, camera on each of us and a screen. So you can see everyone else who's in the scene on the screens. And then our green room was outside and it was like a gazebo with some heaters. Um, but I have still done because of the way COVID's kind of hit. It. it's actually been really great for actors in terms of um it's kind of opened up loads of jobs because um people are way more up for you using your own home studio kind of setup um so it was a really good investment um at the start of covid for people to sort of get mics and stuff um because if you've got a wardrobe and you can throw up a duvet and some um pillows and stuff and create a sort of nice sound space um then you're going to get work and it's been for actors quite good because especially I'm based in Manchester and it's meant that I can do jobs for people all over the country um, without getting to their studios. Yeah, I can see, absolutely see that. Um, Samuel wants to know when directing someone for a single voice audio book, what do you do if the actor is getting incredibly frustrated with themselves over fluffed lines? Uh, well, um, you just have to take some time out. I would just say, let's have a cup of tea or something. That's what I would say. And and reassure them. And sometimes um, it is difficult because some actors are, you know, a little bit dyslexic. I I, I think if you're doing a, an audio book, that's a problem. <laughs> I, think, I think you need to make sure they're not, that's not who you cast. Uh, sorry, dyslexic actors. Um, but because you're on an iPad, um, you know, you can ask them to just make the screen bigger and... Um, I think you have to be patient, really. Uh, it'll be, they might be tired, they might need a break, they might need to drink some water, they might need, um, there might be some actor traps in the text itself, um, where certain lines are just really hard to say, and you've got to, you've got to change the words around a little bit and make it easier, make it more fluent for them. Um, and they'll be losing confidence and being anxious. So you've just got to find a way of bringing the whole temperature down and um, pretending there's all the time in the world, even though there probably isn't. Um, okay, and, and the next one is around pitching projects um, yourself. So do you pitch projects yourself as the director producer or are you brought on board to direct by independent teams uh, and how do you get the good gigs? As a director, it's yes. really hard. I'm sorry, it's, it's horribly hard. That's why I try to bring a whole load of people into um, the BBC world. but. Um, in-house directors in drama for the BBC never leave because where they're going to go. Do we as indies use freelancers? Um, yeah, sometimes. Um, but again, that has to come out of our existing budget. So it's more expensive for us to do so. But, um, you know, I, I will if I don't have time or there's somebody I particularly want to work with. Or It's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. I mean, I, I think if you're if that's your aspiration, I would just say do lots of directing. Work, do some of your own plays, work in theatre, you know, get some credits, um, come up with ideas, find a great writer, be a great writer, director team, be unmissable, you know, unstoppable. Um, just keep pushing on the doors, make some stuff, have some web, have a website, make us, help us get who you are and what you can offer. A, a question next for Eve. Um, what do you do to keep oh, up I've with the industry and be seen by potential producers? How proactive do you have to be to get new jobs? Um, so it kind of depends at what stage in your career you are, I suppose. And um, when I first started out, I was kind of probably more proactive than I am now, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I emailed lots of people um, and kind of applied for everything and anything. Um, and then I ended up, after quite a few different agents, uh, ended up with quite a good agency. Um, and so they do a lot of... Uh, job hunting for me and a lot of to be honest I get a lot of work 
from um, people I've worked with before, which is always really nice. Um, so sometimes it's not actually the best idea to bang people's doors down, um, much as that kind of is your instinct. But actually the best thing to do is be really, really good <laughs> when you get in the room. And then people are more likely to recommend you to their friends who are producers or to um, other directors. And to be honest, that's how I found that I um, get my best jobs is usually through a referral through um a director or a producer that's how i actually met mel was um i had worked with a sound um a sound engineer and um uh well two sound engineers actually that worked with mel and had sort of been recommended so it's kind of doing I suppose I do more in the room these days. Or well, having said that, I still invite people to shows and invite people to listen to things that I've li- that I'm in. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah so it's no, a bit I of both. See, yeah, I can see that's a good way to get get that. Um, uh, next question, Mel. I think this is one for you. Are a- actors who have a great deal of experience more expensive than those with less? They certainly are. <laughs> um, they certainly are. Whether that's in house or whether that's for a BBC production or um, or an something completely independent, um, commissioned separately, and uh, and it makes sense, you know. I mean, so they should be. Um, yeah, they are. How important is it to have a very strong knowledge of effects and the technical aspects of audio recording for audio drama? Can a theatre director jump straight in and start directing audio? Um, yes, uh, but I think you, you know, you, you, you've got a team, you need a sound recordist with you. It's a bit like being, you know, we're not, we're not as, we're not as multi-talented as all you great factual producers who have been self-op for you know for decades now. Um, it's a bit like being the queen, really, <laughs> being a drama director, especially when inside the BBC. I thought it's like being the queen. You never have to talk money or contracts inside the BBC, um, but on the outside, obviously, you do all the time. But I still am a queen because I need a really good sound recordist and a really good sound engineer, or you know, a sound engineer recordist with me if I'm on location or in studio, and I need a fantastic. Um, sound designer to mix my program afterwards i wouldn't attempt to do that with a big ambitious drama um mel one one for you again um do you listen for new talent in true indie productions done by folks with far less budget than you speak of um there's some amazing shows what have you listened to that you love and why do you love it I don't listen to much fit fiction podcasting, and I'll tell you why. It's because I'm old, really, and most of it is genre, as far as I can tell, kind of slightly sci-fi, slightly spooky, um, and uh, and also I just don't have enough time. I, and it sounds pathetic, doesn't it? But I'm I'm busy, not just doing my own work, but I things as well. I have a really rich um, life. I'm very lucky. Uh, I have children, grandchildren, um, teenagers who partly stay with me um and um a dog you know many many things and i do i listen avidly to audio um and i listen to um john but not a lot of indie stuff i listen to podcasts and you know a fair bit um but uh if you want to send me something or um send me a recommendation of stuff i should be listening to from that sector outside my current world i'd be really interested thank you Next question is around who should be in charge of the recording studio, the director or the sound and technical effects director? No, I'm hiring everybody in the, in, the, in yeah. service of my project, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Eve, um, just asking a question. What's the best note you've ever been given? Ooh. Um, <laughs> I think probably actually... Um, with Lizzie B, uh, which we were doing earlier, it was to do, uh, like, finding her age and um, Mel suggesting a change in pitch when we did that um, and a brightness. It was just like this... It's it, When it's really minimal, it was like, I just want a bit more brightness and a change in pitch. And it completely, like, found the character. Um, so I think those kinds of notes probably a, my favorite or when they're imaginative so things like um just a reminder of the situation the scenario like remember this is really romantic um for me that will be enough to kind of get my imagination going and uh get me really in the mood 
<laughs> right. Just, I'm just going to squeeze um, in another couple I, of questions. I, I, but sorry, Mel, okay. do you want to say something? I just want to say quickly that a lot of, um, quite often I'll get actors who are just, just too enthusiastic um, for that moment. And, and it's about what I would say, bringing them down. And, and a note that I've often given is to say, okay, just let's, let's just do it differently. Let's pretend that you're, you're in Tesco trying to find something that you don't, you know, dog food or something really mundane and just, just, you know, and just be more quieter and um, a bit more boring. Sorry. That's just a note I, I have given more than once. <laughs> a bit um, Rachel would like to know, you mentioned near the beginning, Mel, that you need to make sure the script is studio ready. What do you mean by that? I mean that it, everything is, every word is where it needs to be. And I know exactly what the point, what the story is and what the, you know, what it's about, which is different from what happens. Uh, I, I, I bang on at that, uh, about that to writers all the time. What's, what's, what's this really about? What are you really trying to say here? And the same question of each scene that I'm going to record and I'll make notes. I'll know exactly, you know, a scene is one person wants something and it's most elemental and one person won't give it to them. So who's who and what's the power imbalance and how is that shifted by the end of each scene? Um, well, that managed to fit in as many questions as we can because we're now running out of time. Um, but thank you so much for all of them and apologies to people I didn't reach. Uh, Mel, do you want to just say how people can contact you if they want to? Yeah, um, have a look on our website, Spark Club Productions. My name, email and phone number, there's no secrets, um, are up there. And if you want to drop me a line with a question that we haven't managed to address today, I'm really happy to give it my best shot. And there were, there were, you said there was a question that you'd like to throw out there to people watching just before we go. Um, yeah, OK, two things, really. One, um, I'm really interested in that whole question about my question is, how do I know if I've made anything good? Uh, as program makers or as audio makers, how do we know when we've made something if it's good? What you know? How do we how do we evaluate our own work or each other's work? Is there a way? I'm really interested in that. It's a kind of existential question, really, but with could have a very practical um, uh, application. And then the other thing is, I'm really interested in um, the kind of dogma ninety five idea of of writing a manifesto for making audio fiction and um, that is completely without artifice, real places, real sound, music in the place, um, that kind of thing. I was interested in talking about a manifesto for a new kind of audio fiction experience. Um, I'd be really, it would be a fun conversation to have, a fun group to form. Okay, that's it. And they can reach you via the Spark Lab. Uh, website so that thank you thank you for that thank you very much to Eve and the very best of luck to both of you with our friends in the north um, we will be uh, coming back in the new year this is the last of our webinars this year uh, we do have one space left on our training workshop in December which is about operating sound desks so please go to the website if you'd like to sign up for that um, also keep an eye out for what's coming up in the new year and of course, many of our webinars and uh, this one uh, will be available on the previous webinars page on the Audio Train website. So goodbye. Mm -hmm.